going to discuss what's wrong with pseudoscience. Okay, first off, it consumes energy. The fact that there are people who um, purvey information that isn't true causes people who are looking for solutions, who are looking for explanations, to waste their energy on these faulty sources that could be spent more profitably pursuing something that has scientific evidence to support it. So that, and, and as a result would then be much more likely to be helpful, right? So we, um, I'm gonna use an example here of the pseudoscientific claim that immunization causes autism. Um, back in the 90s, a researcher published a paper that showed a connection between MMR and development of autism in toddlers. And so a lot of people who read the paper um, not only internalized it and thought that that one paper by itself, that one study by itself, was evidence that MMR vaccines are dangerous, but also they generalized to other vaccines to the point where they were completely convinced that all immunizations were dangerous. Now, just to give you sort of a, let, let me tell you the, the ending to the story before I get into this little piece I've attached here. Um, about, I don't, I don't know, 10 years ago now, that original study has been retracted because it was shown that a lot of the data that was included in the research wasn't actual data, it was numbers that were inserted by the researchers because they were doing junk science. They had an agenda, and when the data didn't actually fit their agenda, they went ahead and tweaked here, dropped that one there, added in a couple of averages, did some things that were not scientifically valid in order to support their assertion that MMR causes autism. So if we take away that one study that has been retracted because of these methodological ethical issues, we're left with no studies that have ever shown any kind of um, connection between immunization and autism. So I pulled this off of the age of autism and um, the author says, does the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine cause autism? I vote yes. So our first thing we can always be aware of when people are, are using non-scientific reasoning is they say things like, I vote yes. <laughs> like we don't take a vote and determine what people think. We collect data and let it show us what is true, right? So he acknowledges that it's just one man's opinion, but one who's spent the last three years listening to parents and enlightened pediatricians and coming through adverse events reports and just generally trying to think for himself. Okay, so let's enjoy that sentence. So he's been listening to parents. Okay, that's good, we should listen to parents. But of course, if you're the parent of a toddler who had seemed fine to you for the first year and a half, two years of their life, and then they got diagnosed with autism as they started to display symptoms that were characteristic of the syndrome, you would be looking for something to explain this change in your child, right? You'd be looking around in the environment, looking for something that would explain this sudden, what appears to you to be this sudden change in what had been an otherwise healthy child. And because the MMR is delivered at 18 months and the average age for diagnosis is two years, you could see where parents might think that that vaccine triggered this set of symptoms. You could see where they might draw that conclusion. It's faulty, but it's a really common thinking error that we make where we see two things that happen out in the environment and, they, and we come to the conclusion that they are somehow correlated with each other. It's called an illusory correlation and we'll talk about it in another chapter. But just because two things happen next to each other does not mean one of them is causing the other or that they're in fact related at all. So we can't be using illusory correlation logic to draw big conclusions, especially about something as important as whether we should be immunizing children. So he listens to parents, okay, probably not the best witnesses, but okay. Then we have enlightened pediatricians. Not those ones who tow the party line that the AMA suggests that they should follow, which is to follow the science, but the enlightened pediatricians who are willing to talk about fringe interpretations and things like that. 
you can tell by my characterization that's probably not your best witnesses either, right? And then his own combing of combing through of adverse events reports, right? Like I'm not trusting him as a witness either, because it looks like he has a, an interpretation that he would like to find support for. He's probably being basically motivated by the confirmation bias. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with talking about the possibility that MMR might cause autism? Well, one of the big problems with it is it has caused a lot of parents to not want to vac vaccinate their children against diseases that are, are quite harmful. The risks that come from these diseases are uh, very harmful, and uh, especially when you compare the damage that the diseases can cause versus the uh, severity or the frequency of the negative, the adverse effects that come from vaccination. There are, there is a subset of people who can't take vaccinations because they are allergic to um, albumin, you know, the whites of eggs. I mean, a lot of, there are legitimate reasons why some people can't be vaccinated. And that's kind of why the rest of us who are healthy enough to take the vaccine probably should, because that way we can provide herd immunity to protect the people who can't be vaccinated. But even worse, I think, than people fearing the MMR, because the MMR is a big combination vaccine and it is kind of scary and it's administered at 18 months because we wait until babies are old enough to be able to handle it before we give them this big vaccine. So, you know, maybe it's proper to be a little bit concerned about that big combination vaccine. But even more concerning than people like at least thinking a little bit about the MMR is that the, people have generalized other vaccines and they've said, basically the argument had become, does M, had gone from does MMR cause autism to do vaccines cause autism? And there's never been even falsified data like what we saw with the MMR. There hasn't even been falsified data that has argued that other vaccines trigger autism. There's never been any claim, scientific or pseudoscientific or junk science wise. It's only been um, sort of extrapolation that has caused people to come to the conclusion that all vaccines are harmful. And now the argument has shifted, well, it might not cause autism, but it'll cause some other harmful effect. It'll cause a seizure or it'll cause um, some other kind of, of negative effect. So the argument, one of the ways that you can tell that you're having a pseudoscientific discussion is when the target keeps shifting. So we start off talking about MMR causing autism, then we start to talk about immunizations causing autism, and then we start talking about whether immunizations are healthy, right? We start to just have this moving target all the time. And that's one of the ways that you can tell we're talking about pseudoscience. And that's what's wrong with pseudoscience, because guess what? Now we are expending all sorts of energy trying to decide whether we should have our children vaccinated, trying to convince our loved ones to vaccinate our you know, nieces and nephews or our, our grandchildren or, or to not vaccinate our nieces or nephews or our grandchildren, um, right? It's like people are expending energy on a topic that the whole thing was based on pseudoscientific evidence in the first place. Like, why are we wasting our energy talking about these things? So um, that is a good example of what I mean by it consuming energy. Another good example of what I mean by it consuming energy is when you look at alternative cancer treatments. I'm going to take you to this really high quality website, so brace yourself. It's quite high quality. All right. So alternative cancer treatments. By working with the biological laws of nature, alternative cancer treatments bring no harm to the body and naturally support vital systems such as the immune system and the lymphatic system. So it sounds awesome, right? Because we all know that, for example, chemotherapy and radiation, those are harmful things, right? And that um, a lot of times people who are going through those kinds of treatments have you know, really bad effects from going through those kinds of cancer treatments. So the idea that there's this alternative where we'll just rely on nature, um, you know, supporting the immune system and the lymphatic system. This all sounds terrific, doesn't it? And um, if you scroll down here, you see all these different things that they talk about, the benefits of cancer treatment alternatives, um, eradicating cancer cells by killing them naturally, enhancing and boosting the immune system, help repair the body internally so it is better able to, to discard cancer cells. Well, this sounds awesome. This sounds way better than chemotherapy or radiation, right? Um, here we have a nice video you can watch about it. 
Um, it tells you all the things that are wrong with conventional treatment. Chemotherapy will destroy your immune system. It's incredibly toxic. Radiation can damage healthy cells. Um, you know, surgery may be more harmful than helpful. I mean, they go through the, all the things that are wrong with conventional treatment. Um, and, and all the things that are much more benign and helpful in the way that they want to treat it. It says here, can alternative cancer treatments help a person who has had conventional cancer treatments? Um, unfortunately, not every person will survive cancer. However, there are lots of individuals who have healed from cancer using treatment alternatives for cancer after being told by conventional practitioners that there's nothing more they can do. Um, so it can work afterwards, but one, I, I must have scrolled past what I wanted to show you though, because they um, said basically that you need to be trying these things first. Um, that if you really want to vanquish cancer from your body, you want to do these alternative things before you attempt chemotherapy and radiation and whatever else your, um, your conventional oncologist wants to do because using those things first might make it less likely that the alternative treatments would work. Okay. That sounds good. Except for what if as a cancer patient, you try these things, which are not shown scientifically to work. You try all these things, they don't work for you. And you forego using the conventional treatments that have been shown to be efficacious. So you wait some amount of time trying out these alternative treatments first. And then when you finally decide to go back to the conventional treatment route, you discover it might be too late. That it may, you know, that maybe it's advanced more and now it's not going to work. This happened to Steve Jobs. He had a type of pancreatic cancer that typically um, is fairly slow growing and should have had a pretty decent response. Um, had he used conventional treatments, but he decided to go alternative instead. And he tried diet and all these other um, supplements and things first. And when he finally did attempt to use conventional treatments, it was too late. Um, it consumes energy when we tell people pseudoscientific things. They, they may feel like they have to explore it, that they have to give it a try. Like the, one of the least scientific things that you could ever say is, well, I mean, it's possible. Because just about anything is possible, that's true. But shouldn't we go with what is the most quantifiably certain? So consuming energy can really lead to disastrous results. It can also just lead to annoying results. You know, endless debates where one person is using pseudoscientific evidence and the other one is trying to use scientific evidence. And we're having these debates about things that really shouldn't be debatable. Um, we have evidence to show the, the, the answer, and instead we're choosing to debate from a pseudoscientific perspective. Consumes people's energy in lots of different ways. Another problem with pseudoscience is it discredits legitimate science. It makes people wonder, I can't trust anybody. All scientists are biased and doing junk science. Or all people who, per, you know, um, portray themselves as, as having a solution for, for a problem are on equal footing, even though some of them are basing their solutions on data and some people are basing their solutions on feelings or logic, they're all the same to me. I can't really tell the difference among them. That discredits legitimate science. So we're worried that all science is going to be viewed as junk or pseudoscience. And I see evidence of this on the internet all the time when people talk on social media about things. Um, they'll insert whatever topic of the day is going on, people will be having some kind of disagreement about ways to view the, the debate. And one person will provide data from their source that they trust. And somebody else will provide data from their source that they trust. And they'll act as though they've come to a stalemate. That's the word I'm looking for. Like they've come to a stalemate. Well, I've got my evidence and you've got your evidence and we'll never be able to tell which one is accurate. Sometimes as an observer, I try not to comment on these kinds of things on Facebook too often because it never goes well. Um, 
oftentimes one of the one of the parties has presented data that is scientific and came from a, a legitimate um, you know methodology and things like that. And the other person has presented oftentimes descriptive statistics that are collected by um, some organization or something that's not doing it for science, but it's trying to prove a point. And the fact that they can't tell the difference between it is really disheartening, that they can't tell that one of these is a scientific study with a, a method section and a results section and all the data there, you know, all the patterns there available for you to really peruse and understand. And the other one came from a web page where somebody else filtered it or it was just descriptive statistics anyway, and they're drawing inferences from descriptive statistics, which you can't do. Um, it's really disheartening that, you know, the average American can't really tell the difference between those two sources. Um, they'll look at things like, well, who posted this? So if it was linked, so if you have a scientific study that was linked by a news outlet that your, you know, debate partner doesn't approve of, then they'll discount the scientific study because you found it on a, on a website that they don't, they don't think is legitimate. The scientific studies, it's not their fault <laughs> that the, that the web page chose to link them. Um, the scientific study is the scientific study, right? And so it's, it's very disheartening that the average American is starting to think all scientists are junk scientists. They all have a bias. They all have a motive. Um, they are all just trying to prove their viewpoint is true or that they're no better than pseudoscientists who are just sort of concocting, um, you know, outcomes. They're using, you know, some kind of hocus pocus method of generating evidence. The other thing that I've noticed about, you know, pseudoscience um, influencing people's judgments of regular science is that it people have become really skeptical of any research that had a funding source. Um, unless it was the federal government, for some reason, people think an NIH grant or NIMH grant or something from the government, that's fine, which it's not any more fine than any other funding source. Um, the government always has its goals also. So don't ever think just because it's a government that it's any more unbiased right? Any more objective than any other source. I pulled this example off of junkscience.com and you can tell from all the ellipses that I took a lot of, a lot of this guy's wordiness out and I just left us with the basic gist. So Dr. Topol did research on um, statins and what he, what he was looking at is there's a, there's a standard cutoff point of how high a person's cholesterol is before doctors should recommend that they start taking statin drugs to try and manage their cholesterol. So in his study, he had people who had numbers that were lower than that cutoff, but sort of on that brink, right? They were within a few points of the cutoff. And he administered statins to those patients. And then they, of course, had control patients who didn't take the statins. And he compared the um, rates of heart attacks and, and um, deaths from heart-related things among the, the participants. And what he found is that those patients whose numbers were below the cutoff, but who were given statins, had better outcomes than the people who were below the cutoff and didn't take statins. So basically, he said we should change the cutoff numbers. We should lower those cutoff numbers. And that would, in effect, triple the number of people who should be taking statins in the U.S., and so he reported that in the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, this guy is, criti the, the guy, Stephen Malloy, is criticizing the New England Medical, um, sorry, the New England Journal of Medicine for not disclosing that Dr. Topol's employer receives financial support from two pharmaceutical co companies. Um, it, the New England Journal of Medicine mentioned, you know, well, Dr. Topol's expertise and reputation mean that he's not going to be influenced by money. I'm not sure if that's a, a legitimate argument. Much more important is that um, the pharmaceutical company's support for Dr. Topol's employer doesn't involve statins. They don't give that his employer money to do research on statins. So it's not like he, like he, he was even indirectly being paid 
by, to do research on statins by companies that would benefit from that research. He wasn't even indirectly being paid for the, by that. It's even, it's hard for me to even explain what the argument is because it's kind of convoluted. I mean, to think that, you know, I work for a university and I should have to disclose that my university receives funds from entities that might somehow benefit from the outcomes of my research. I don't even know all the entities that give money to my university. Like, how would I even know what those are? So how should I have, why should I have to reveal um, relationships that aren't even directly my relationship? I mean, I don't even understand this logic on this junk science web website. I generally, you know, appreciate what, what they talk about on junk science, that we really need to be skeptical and look at, at, at things. But this is a really convoluted way of trying to just say, if, if there's money coming from pharmaceuticals, you can't do research on pharmaceuticals. Like basically, that's what they're saying. If there's any kind of tie to pharmaceuticals, you can't do research on, on any kind of pharmaceutical. And that's saying that we basically can't develop new pharmaceuticals at all. We can't decide what the dosage rate should be. We can't do any of that stuff because, of course, the pharmaceutical industry is going to fund that kind of research. I mean, it's just how it is. Not all scientists are junk scientists because they have a funding source. I think we have to be really careful about saying that any scientist who gets money from government grants, that they're somehow pure because government grants are often tied up in whatever is the hot topic at the moment. And so if you manage to tie what you're studying to whatever the hot topic of the moment is, you're going to get a grant much more likely than a person who's just doing basic research that maybe isn't the hot, um, you know, important thing to the current administration or whatever. So we have to be really careful about assuming government grants good, um, you know, private industry grants always tainted. We have to be really careful about that. But people have uh, developed this idea that I will be skeptical about that. I'll be skeptical about who paid for this study or, you know, which political party, you know, benefits from the study. I'll, I'll be skeptical about that. But I won't be skeptical about, you know, basically what kinds of data they have or, um, you know, other kinds of like actual scientific questions. So hopefully you guys will leave this being aware that you need to be skeptical about the methodology and, um, you know, keep in the back of your mind that, that if the results are consistent with the funding source, that yeah, maybe this has the potential to be junk science, but don't just throw something out because there was a funder. That's all I can say about that. Okay. So in the next segment, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about why humans embrace pseudoscientific claims so much. So I will see you in the next segment.